said, um, we'll begin reading here at verse 1 in 1 John chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 and uh, looking at testing the spirits. We'll see that in just a moment. So beginning here in 1 John 4 at verse 1, reading to verse 3. John writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So as we begin here, this is a continuation of what he had just stated in chapter 3, the last verse, verse 24, where John had said, He who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit whom God has given to us. Now, let me give you a little bit of a, a backdrop as to what's taking place here and what is provoking uh, John to write these words at this particular place. At this time, false teachers were already beginning to enter churches in order to infiltrate and undermine the faith of believers. And what they would do is they would walk into the church and they would say that they were um, giving a message that was spirit-inspired. And when they gave the message, it actually, instead of bringing uh, the people together, it actually began to breed some confusion. Now, that's something that you'll see in your New Testament as you read through your Bible. You're going to see that very early in the history of the church, there were false teachers entering in and warnings that were being given consistently. I'll give you a few examples. I could give you this from almost every book of the New Testament, but I'm just giving you something uh, just to kind of bolster that point. Paul addressed this in uh, 2 Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul said, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So they were entering in, saying that the rapture had occurred, and people were being shaken up by that. So Paul had to write in reference to that to clear that up. Peter did the same thing in 2 Peter in chapter 2, verse 1. The apostle Peter said, There were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. In the Old Testament, there were false prophets. In the New Testament, Peter says, there will be false teachers. Jude, in the book of Jude, verse 4, said it like this. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. So they were already entering in. They were already bringing in messages undermining the gospel. You see, false teachers bring in teachings that undermine true faith. And what it does is it'll undermine everything about it, especially it will undermine our hope in God. In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, in chapter 13, verse 22, we read, Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad whom I have not made sad, and you have strengthened the hands of the wicked so that he does not turn from his wicked way to save his life, having given the wicked a false confidence. So in the Old Testament as well as the New, there were false prophets as well as false teachers. Now in this case, the people were claiming to be speaking for God, and so John reminded them not to believe every word purported to be from God. Obviously, people will say this. They do it to this day. They, they say that they're speaking for God. But there needs to be a way for people to distinguish truth from error. Now, during his day, itinerant preachers would enter the church and speak, and they would give prophecies. But prophecy must be tested 
because of the abundance of false prophets. How do we do that? Well, believers test the prophet by the word of God. Does it line up with what the word of God says? A lot of times what I've seen in my years of walking with the Lord and teaching, people are deceived because they don't know God's word. They just don't know it. And because somebody stands up and quotes a scripture, many times they don't even turn you or refer you to it. I got in the habit when I was uh, 20, 23, 22, 23, I got in the habit of, because I was taught to do this by a group called the Navigators when I was in the military, I, I, I learned to, to give cross-references so that when the message is given, and you'll see this, you see this, I, I quote a lot of scripture. Why? Because I'm not the authority, because God is. And so prophets would walk in, and they would say, thus saith the Lord. And how are you to know whether this person's telling the truth? Or how are you to know what they're saying is actually from God? How are you to know that? That's what we're looking at here in 1 John because there's a way to test the prophets and all of that. You see, again, it has to be tested because of the abundance of false teachers. And so what you do is you look to see if it lines up with Scripture. That means that we have to be people who are students of the Word of God. That means that we don't rely on just a Wednesday or a Sunday, but we do our daily reading and our daily prayer, and we build up our faith in Christ. That's how you begin to learn to do that. So with these itinerant preachers, these people who would go from place to place, they would come, they would enter in, and they would want to speak in the church. They would enter church services. They want to exercise their gifts. And it became a normal practice during church services in the early church. So the message that they're giving has to be proven, has to be tested. It has to line up with Christian doctrine. You see, by this time, the majority of the letters and the gospels had already been written. First John is written somewhere around 90, between 90 and 95. So by that time, the majority of the writings of the New Testament had already been circulated. So he could see it in Scripture. You could line it up with the letters of Paul or the various letters that were circulating at that time. And so they were able to look at that. You see, the heart of the church, from Jesus' pronouncement of our, of our mandate, our, our, our uh, great commission, the heart of the church is to proclaim the gospel. In Matthew, for example, chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus had said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. A lot of times, in, in especially in my early years, there would be ministers who would say, your great commission is to go. And so that was a call for us to get up and leave the pew and, and take the word out. And by the way, I I 100% believe that we're to take this message out of these walls and give them to people. Obviously, we share it with our friends, our family, co-workers, neighbors when given an opportunity, whatever. We have that opportunity. We ought to take it when given to us. But the Great Commission is larger than simply going because when you look into this Matthew 28, 19, and 20, when you're looking for what is called the main verb, what is the center of what he's saying? What is he saying that is to be the, 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 the way that you act? It's not the word go. You would think that the word go is the main verb. It's not. The main verb is make disciples. So as you go, where you go, when you go, make disciples. And a disciple, how does a person become a disciple? Well, he said you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he goes on to say, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So how are you going to know everything he has commanded if you're not in the word? And that's why we're to teach the whole counsel of God. That's why we do that. Like Paul said, I have not abstained from giving you the entire counsel of God. I haven't hesitated to do that. I've given you the whole counsel. Why? Because it's the whole counsel that makes the whole Christian. And so we need the word of God in all of that. And so by this time, the majority of, of writings had been given. You could look at the scripture. The mandate was to teach people. And so what happens is, the gospel had taken root in people's lives. People were being, being saved. When that happens, the enemy counterattacks. And what he does is he sends infiltrators into the church. Jesus spoke of this when he was speaking in Matthew 13 concerning the, the wheat and the tares. You know, the, the enemy sows tares amongst the wheat, the false that appears to be the true, because a tear and wheat look the same, 
until they come to full maturity. And you can always tell only when they are fully matured. And so people can look like Christians for a long time, can be going to church services for a long time, and you don't know the difference until the very end. And so people are being saved, and as this is taking place, Satan is sending infiltrators. And so the apostles, the writers of the New Testament began to respond with letters. An example would be found in Galatians in chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Listen to what Paul the apostle said. He said, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to per pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. That's how serious this message of the gospel is. If someone's perverting it, twisting it, changing it, may he be condemned forever by God himself. You see, Satan has a false gospel. And Satan has false ministers. And they work tirelessly. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 14, Paul said, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So, false teachers make their appearance, come into the church, they give the word in an incorrect fashion, and they undermine the faith of those who love the Lord. When I first got saved, I began to encounter people who were professing to be Christian. I was 20 years old, freshly saved, when I began to have people who were claiming to know Christ. I began having them come into my life and share things with me, and it, it, it caused me to to want to know more of the truth because the, the better I knew the truth, the easier it would be to discern the false, right? And it's amazing because we've had false teachers um, who have come onto this campus. We've had them go into the bookstore and, and try and um, convert people. As a matter of fact, one of our employees many years ago was converted to a false doctrine by people who were coming in here. And we didn't know it until he, he let us know he was leaving. Then we found out what had happened. There were people who were coming in, proselytizing him so that he would follow them, and he did. He ended up following after them. We've had that happen. I remember when I was uh, a young pastor, the church was, was only less than a year old because we had a, an office on uh, B Street right off of Euclid in Ontario, right by where Logan's Candy was. Some of you are, are familiar with the area. If not, I don't care. But anyway, <laughs> but we, were, we had a little office there. And it was uh, my, my first office I had as the pastor of our fellowship was 10 by 10. So it's just a little, little office. And there were like, I think, three, three there were six offices. And it was, uh, was kind of like a holiday uh, weekend and all. And I had gone into the office to do some work. And I heard the front door open up because the front glass door, uh, I didn't lock it. And so I heard somebody walk in and I heard the door as it closed. And, and he went off to the right side because I was on the left side. He went on the right side and I heard him knock it on and I heard somebody doing that. So I'm just sitting there. I'm sitting at my desk looking towards the door and I'm waiting. I'm waiting for someone to knock on the door because I could hear him and he knew nobody was in the office. So I was the only one there. I knew I was going to have a visit with somebody. I didn't know who. I'll never forget how I heard a knock on the door. And I said, come in. So, oh, boy, there's somebody here. You know, that's what he's thinking. You can't believe it. The door opened up just, just maybe four inches, just a little bit. And a hand came in, just a hand. And it had a little finger puppet on it, just a little puppet, eyes and nose and a mouth. And he's doing this. And all I can see is his hand. 
And he goes, and he talks with a high voice. Hi, what are you doing? Like that. <laughs> and I said, I spoke to, I spoke to the puppet. I, I said, I, I'm doing good. And he goes, what are you doing today? I said, why don't you bring the rest of your body in? You know, so this guy comes walking in and he came to tell me that he was from a particular organization that was worldwide evangelistic. And I, so I asked him, I said, what church do you attend? What church are you representing in this area? He said, oh, I'm not from this area. I'm from Los Angeles. I said, really? Why are you here? He says, well, I'm wanting to share people with people this good news. And it and, uh, turned out he was, a, he was a cult member. He was with uh, Reverend Sun Young Moon. And he, he was a Mooney. And, uh, you know, so we had an interesting conversation and all. But they, they will come to your office. They will come to your house, and if they can, they'll come to your church. And that's what they were doing in the early church. They were itinerant. They would go from place to place, enter in, and they would want to speak a message to the people. These are false teachers, and that's what John is speaking about. And so because of that, notice verse 1. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, when he says this, when he says do not believe, that it's in a tense in the original language that, that carries with it the connotation of stop believing. He's concerned that some of them are being deceived. So he's saying stop believing every itinerant teacher. They're leading you astray because they're preaching a false Christ. You see, the fruit of a true prophet is, is really very basic. The, the words of this true prophet uh, line up with Scripture, and Jesus is glorified. When somebody stands up and gives a prophetic word, if that person giving the word is regarded in such a way that it eclipses the glory of Christ, he's not to be listened to. People are not to put themselves in the place of drawing attention to themselves. All true prophecy will bring glory to God himself. And what we've seen, amen, and what we've seen today, I, I have to say it, it, what we've seen today is people are glorifying the prophet. They're glorifying the person. And I, can, I, I have a lot of experience with, with what I'm saying right now, and I can tell you that when you expose somebody, when you say this person isn't teaching the truth, you ought to see how their followers act. They get so mad, they attack you, they say things to you. What are you, jealous? Oh, there are more people in his ministry than yours and this and that. I mean, they, they, they always, it just, shows the, it just shows the carnality and the fruit of that prophet because they're, they're saying, well, a lot of people follow him, therefore he must be telling the truth. Hardly anybody follows you. you your teachings, you aren't telling the truth. They, they do that, and you'll see that, and that happens, it happens often. So the fruit of the very uh, of a true prophet is very basic. Uh, is is it lining up with what the Word of God says when it's rightly divided, and is Jesus Christ the center of it? In John sixteen thirteen and fourteen, Jesus said it like this. He said, "When He, the Spirit of Truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He'll show you things to come." He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it to you. He shall glorify me. That's why we have been very careful to have Jesus the center of ministry. That's just the key. When you go into the main sanctuary, we would see Jesus. That's the whole purpose of the church service is to see Jesus. And so stop believing every itinerant teacher test them. He says in verse 2, by this you know the, the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So the key to testing is what do they say about Christ? Do they recognize Jesus as God in the flesh? You see, a true prophet says Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He is not what would be called a Christ spirit. 
He's not the energy of God. He's not a manifestation of God. He's not a revelation of God. He is God in human flesh. Now, in context, remember, in our introduction, I pointed out that John was writing to, um, to, to, to teach his listeners to be aware of the Gnostics, a, uh, a group of philosophers who had entered into the churches and were preaching a false Christ. And the Gnostics would not admit this. The Gnostics denied the incarnation of Jesus. Now, he'd already said this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. He had said, who is a liar? He went on to say, it is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. You see, why is that important to understand Jesus as God in the flesh? Well, God, as God in human flesh, Jesus put away sin one time for all time by making a perfect offering. In Hebrews 9, 26, it says he, uh, then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus made a one time for all time sacrifice. So to reject his incarnation is to quench the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And in resisting the conviction of the Spirit, you will reject salvation. Now, notice in verse 3 how he says, he says, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Over 2,000 years ago, this particular spirit, the spirit of the Antichrist, had already been working. Now, when he speaks of the spirit of Antichrist, it speaks of uh, that which is empowering and influencing the deceivers. The deceivers who reject Jesus Christ, these are unre unregenerate people. These are unbelievers. They reject the lordship of Jesus. He says in uh, 2 John, in verse 7, many deceivers who do not uh, acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. And he goes on to say any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. So these people are preparing the way for Antichrist, the final arch opponent of Jesus. I want to develop this with you for a moment. The Antichrist will be accepted. I used to wonder, how is that possible? I really did. I used to wonder, how is it possible? See, growing up in the America that I grew up in, and I know it's ancient history, but growing up in that America, it was entirely different than today's America. It just was. It was entirely different. Not that it was, you know, I'm not longing for the old days or anything like that. I don't have the spirit of nostalgia. It's just a fact. In the old days, in the older days, in the days that I grew up, it was a different America. I can remember my mom before she went home to be with Jesus, how she said to me, son, I just can't understand the way the world is today she said i'm ready to go home and at that time I, I i thought well mama you know where's your hope as i've grown older and i've seen the corruption the decay that uh that has really overtaken much of america and every not every single place thank god but that has that the, the evil that has become recognized as good the things that are are, are said in on, on TV or in movies and all that, at one time were so inappropriate, now are accepted. I, I can see how that happens. I can especially see now how the Antichrist, and I'm not going to go into great detail about this, just make a comment. I can see how, how the Antichrist will be accepted because people want to believe what he says. The way that people today are so polarized politically, they're so polarized. They, they don't even, many people don't seem to think through the issues that they feel so fervent about. They, they, they don't think through the issues. They, and so if, if you are red, then they're blue, and they're blue, you're not going to get along. Why? Because they believe they're, what they're calling their truth is the truth, and you're, 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 you're lying. And it's very difficult to communicate to somebody who refuses to see that there may be another side to what's being said. That's kind of new. Because in the earlier days, and I grew up in, you know, we'll say in the 60s and all, when people called themselves liberal, 
they were still open-minded. You know, just say this, people, so older, older people understand what I mean when I say this. John F. Kennedy was a liberal when he was president. He would be a conservative today just by the things that he believed and said because that was America. So what you've seen, those of you who are, a bit, are younger perhaps, you have seen an America that has morphed in my lifetime. And so when I see that people are so quick to swallow, you know, the things that are being said, that's how Antichrist will be accepted. He will have false prophets preparing the way. They're going to foster a, an atmosphere of acceptance. There's going to be a growing and ready audience for these false teachers. And so that's already taking place now. So after the rapture of the church, there will be a great rejection of Christianity. False prophets will continue to abound. They will be proclaiming the Antichrist. And at that time, the man of sin will be revealed, who is called the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 provide some details for us. I'm going to read those verses and give you a few things out of that, speaking of Antichrist. So in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4, it says, let, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. So Paul gives us information about the Antichrist. One, he calls him the man of sin. The reason he's referred to as the man of sin is because he is satanically energized. In Revelation 13, verse 2, it says the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. Because Satan so indwells the Antichrist, his chief delight will be to break the law of God. So he calls him the man of sin. He also refers to him as the son of perdition or the man who is doomed to destruction. That would be speaking of his destiny. He's going to be destroyed. He will not prevail. In, it, it speaks in verse 8 of the same chapter, 2 Thessalonians the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. But his destiny is perdition. A third thing about him is he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or worshipped. His determined opposition to God will be a leading feature of the apostasy. Revelation 13, 6 says he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those that dwell in heaven. Uh, I was mentioning in a Sunday morning recently, the word blasphemy is not a word that people are familiar with anymore. To, to blaspheme God is to, is to denigrate him. It's to reduce him. It's to show him disrespect. It's a, it's a, it, it, was a, it was a sin punishable by capital punishment in the Old Testament. Blasphemy was a capital offense. Today, you can't say certain words but you can say God's name in vain. You see it on TV all the time. It's easy. They just come out and blaspheme God constantly. We already are in a period where that's accepted. In Daniel eleven thirty seven, it says that he'll show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Paul said, again, he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, that's been called the abomination of desolation. Antichrist standing in what is called the holy place, demanding to be worshipped. We studied the Revelation, I can tell you that, and Daniel, I can tell you that this is an event that takes place in the middle of the seven-year period called the tribulation. After the rapture, tribulation, great tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, leading to the great tribulation, that's when he, he stands in the temple showing himself to be God. Daniel 9.27 says he'll confirm a covenant with many for one seven, speaking of a seven-year period. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he'll set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, Antichrist is going to have a religious aspect, but also a military aspect. 
all of this is being formed right now, by the way. We're living in a time when this is all good. You're, you know, this is going to take place, I believe, really soon. And so what he'll do is he's going to confirm a covenant with the nation of Israel. But in the middle of that covenant, in the third and a half year, he's going to break the covenant. The way he's going to break it is by the abomination of desolation. Now, in Revelation 11, 1 and 2, we read, I was given a reed like a measuring rod, was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar. Count the worshipers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months, for three and a half years. We go up into the area. It's up there where the uh, Dome of the Rock is. And we'll go up there. We've been up there many times. And you'll see the Dome of the Rock, and we walk past it. We don't go into it. On the Dome of the Rock, there is a... Uh, um, uh, a, a Quranic scripture, if you will, uh, that basically paraphrasing says, uh, God has no son. And that's a, it's a, a blasphemy against Jesus himself. God has no son. And so we never go into it. I've never been into it. We go around it. But as you go around it, you go to an area that has what they call the Dome of the Spirits or the Dome of the Tablets. When you stand there by that, we have a Bible study. I, I give a study out of Revelation 11, 1 and 2. Now, we can't bring a Bible onto the um, Temple Mount. You can't bring a Bible up there. The Muslims have control over that. They do not want you to have script, Scripture on you. So they actually will, we have to leave our, our stuff at, at a certain place uh, when we're about to enter in, and they don't want you to have that. So what I do is I have a piece of paper with the scripture on it. And the people will stand around me, and, uh, and I read this scripture that I just read to you. And, um, and, and as I do that, as I read the scripture to them, I say to them, if you look to our right, you see the Dome of the Rock. But if you look straight ahead where I'm facing right now, I'm looking towards the east, I said right in front of us, here in front of the Dome of the Spirit, just spirits just up there a couple hundred yards, you can see the archway to the entrance to the eastern gate. That's where Christ and the priests, that's where they would have come in through the eastern gate as they were entering in towards the temple. But if you look to the right, the Dome of the Rock is not lined up with the eastern gate. So, Asher Kaufman, who is an archaeologist, as well as my pastor Chuck Smith and others, believed that the Dome of the Spirit, Dome of the Tablet, that that is the actual highest point there on the Temple Mount because the Holy of Holies would have been in the highest place. And so when we're standing right there at the Dome of the Spirit's looking straight towards the eastern gate, I, I, I read the scripture and I say, how... Will the Jews be able to put a temple up here? Now, when you go to Israel, you go into the Temple Institute. They already have everything prepared that they have. I don't believe they have the ashes of the red heifer, but they have the different utensils that are used for sacrifice. They've tr the, the, the priests have been trained and have never forgotten the art of sacrifice. They're called the Kohen. If you know anybody whose last name is Kohen, that's a name that comes from the Kohanim, and they are, they're the priesthood. So the Kohans are already aware of these things. They're already aware. They already know how to do sacrifice. They've never forgotten how. They're just waiting for the opportunity. And so we'll stand there, and we'll look, and, right, and I'll say right where we're at would have been the temple, the Holy of Holies. To my right is a place that is outside, even as it says, it says, go and measure the temple of God and the altar. Count the worshipers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. How will Israel be able to rebuild the temple? You've heard this many times. There will be a covenant made between this Antichrist that has been referred to here in 1 John. Between the Antichrist and Israel. Part of that temple 
part of that agreement, that covenant, will be the rebuilding of the temple. The temple will be rebuilt. But in the middle of the seven, in the third and a half year, he breaks the covenant. When he breaks that covenant, Israel will realize that she has been deceived by the Antichrist. And that's what's going to take place because he's going to demand that Israel worships him. That isn't going to happen. So as a political leader, he's going to make war with the saints during the Great Tribulation. Revelation 13, 7, it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Now, all of that's true, but the great news is that Jesus destroys him at his second coming. In Revelation 19, verse 20, the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And so he goes on and says in verse, verse 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. So you've overcome these false teachers. You haven't been completely deceived. The Holy Spirit has given you victory over his deception. The Holy Spirit has revealed Jesus to you. Because Satan's lies are overcome through the word of God, through God's truth. In verse 5, he says, they're of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. The world loves its own message, and the world receives its own messengers. You know this, I know this, I'll say this quickly, but it's true. You can talk to people who are not Christians, who have no heart for Christ or anything, and you can get along with them, even in a, in a basic religious way. They can say, well, will you pray for me? They can say, yeah, I went to church this Sunday. They can say, I'm faithful at whatever religion I practice, as long as you agree with them that what they're doing is good. But if you say to them, even, even in a loving, kind way, but you don't know Jesus, that's when the mask is removed. That's when people show their true heart. That's when they're angry at you. That's, they, they do. Now, some people will show you that. Some people will get very angry. They, they can gnash their teeth at you. I mean, they can, they, they can call you name. You know that. Some of you have experienced that. Other people will just smile at you and later on talk to their friends about you. Don't go around that. that, that, that that's a Jesus freak over there. That, that one's nuts, man. You know, they're judging me. One of the most interesting things that people will do is they'll say, are you judging me? Yeah. Yeah. No, are you judging me? No, you're judging yourself. You're judging yourself. You know, you, you, you say you love God. No, what you really say is you, you, you like to be calling yourself spiritual. One of the things that people refer to themselves as today, and you know this, is they say, well, I'm spiritual. They'll say that. It's kind of like to cover everything. I'm spiritual. Well, that's not enough. Because standing before the Lord, he's not going to say, David, were you spiritual? You know, the word of God is too clear. That's why I'm telling you, we need to know what the word says and to to obey it. Because in in it is truth and in it is freedom. And and so he says, you know, the world will um, accept what the world has to say. It loves its own message. And, and again, if you say what people want to hear, you'll be accepted. And that's because there's no conviction. That's because there's no sin that they have to deal with. In John 15, 18, and 19, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. But he goes on in verse 6, and he says, We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. And by this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. If you're of God, you'll listen to what God says through the apostles. When he said in verse 6, we are of God, he's speaking of the apostles. And if you're of God, you listen to what God says through the apostles. How do we listen to what God says through the apostles? By reading the word. In John 8, 47, Jesus said it like this. He said, he who is of God hears God's words. But he went on to say, you do not hear because you're not of God. You don't want to listen because your heart is not his. Like Isaiah, when he saw the Lord. 
in the book of Isaiah. He said, in, in the year the king Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And he speaks of the conversation that goes on. And the Lord says, who will go for us? And that's when Isaiah said, here am I, Lord. Send me. Isaiah, for four chapters, had already been teaching and preaching. But then he finally says, in this particular year when Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, which is an interesting portion of scripture because he's already doing the work of a prophet. But now he's had an incredible experience with God. And God says, I need someone to go for me. And he said, here am I. I want to go for you. I want to be somebody who not only hears your word, but I want to give your word. And so as you give the word of God out and people hear, they're demonstrating that they're of God. So if you're hungry to know the word of God, if you're hungry to know him by his word, that's a sure sign that you know the Lord. You see, dead people aren't hungry. You've never seen a hearse pull up to a jack-in-the-box. Dead people aren't hungry. They're not hungry. That makes sense to me. Spiritually dead people are not hungry for God's word. It's one of the ways to be able to test your own heart. How hungry are you for the word of God? How hungry are you for God's word? Are you hungering for him? Are you thirsting for him? Are you seeking for him? That's a good indicator. See, Marie and I we had uh, four babies and, and our grandbabies. And one of the ways that we learned it early is, as a young married couple with our children, Marie knew this faster than I did. She's, she's a good mama. She'd say, something's wrong with the baby. And I'd say, what? How do you know? She said, she's not eating. She's not hungry. Oh, so that's, you know, when a baby's not hungry, and they should be, they're sick. Every mama knows that. There's something wrong here. When they're not hungry, they're sick. So that's a good way to test yourself. Obviously, you're hungry. You're here for a Bible study. That's how you know. I want to know God. How do I know God? By watching somebody on TV as they roll around on the carpet and yell and ask for money. Or by getting into his word, saying, God, speak, Lord, for your, your servant is listening. What you say I want to do. See, that's one of the ways you know where you are with Christ. It is what he says what you want to do. And so John was simply saying that they are not of God. They will not listen. They don't know him. You listen because you're hearing the word of God. And that's an indicator that you're right with him. We'll stop there and pick up next time.